Okay. All right. Let's get started. So welcome, everybody. Um, so, all right. So we are very lucky today to get a great uh, program about tree research. And we're going to be joined by Jim Barron, who's a master's student in the Department of Forestry and Forest and Conservation Science, and also a part of a program called Lessons in Ecology and Evolution, or LEAF. Um, today, my name is Nancy, and I'm joining you as well as uh, Kashifa to help with the answering of the questions. So um, let me just give you a little bit of an idea of the museum if you haven't been there before. Um, first of all, where is it? Um, it is on the traditional unceded ancestral land of the Musqueam people. And we've got this beautiful flag here. Um, I also have the website down at the bottom. We love learning about the Musqueam culture in, in the museum. And if you want to check out their, their website here, it's www.musqueam.bc.ca. Um, to show to you on the map, we're right here at UBC and uh, in the center, basically. Uh, so we're right close to uh, the Pacific Museum of Earth, which is across the, the street from us. Um, we're next near to the Biosciences Building and the Aquatic Ecosystems Building uh, and uh, pretty close to the, the bookstore. Um, when you arrive there, uh, you, you, this is what you would see. And this uh, atrium is filled with this beautiful blue whale skeleton. Uh, if you look behind it, you can see the Biodiversity Research Center as well. Uh, so there's a little closer view of the, the skeleton there and the research center. And together, the museum and the research center uh, form the BD Biodiversity Center. And there are over 50 faculty um, and other researchers involved with all sorts of interesting topics, uh, including ecology topics and evolution topics. Um, and they are, they are there. Now, when you come into the museum, you're going to be going down a ramp. Uh, when we're open, and uh, and eventually you can look up at that blue whale skeleton. Uh, the museum itself, though, that is only the skeleton is only one out of over two million specimens uh, uh, in the museum of all different types. And so uh, we, when you go in, what you find is all these rows filled with specimens, and these cabinets uh, would and other museums would be behind the scenes. And instead, in our museum, we have this very interesting structure where we have over 95% of our specimens in the same room with the visitors and, and the public. So uh, it's a really neat setup. Um, and you can see there's little windows into those cabinets. Sometimes you'll see those, those uh, curators and researchers walking around as well. Uh, and they are, those, those collections are uh, divided into six. Uh, so we've got here the tetrapods, marine and vertebrates. Um, we've got the carbarium, the entomology and the fish and the fossils. So, uh, and uh, today we're talking about trees. So this would be the area of the museum, these rows here, where the trees would be. You can see there's the whale in the front. And um, we're going to be taking your questions. So please do type in questions as we go along and then uh, we'll be asking Jen about them. So Jen, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Is that, yeah, okay. Um, there we go. Okay, uh, can everybody see that? Yep, I can see okay. it. So like Nancy said, my name is Jen Barron. I'm a master of science student at the University of British Columbia in the tree ring lab. Um, and I study and live and recreate on unceded Musqueam territory. Um, and I am a lot of things. I am a researcher, I am a student, um, and I am very involved in my community. And um, some of the things that I'm really interested in are questions about climate change and wildfire and tree rings um, and the impacts that we have on our forests. Um, and how we can help our forests better support us. Um, so I know this question was asked a little earlier, but I'd just like to get an idea of who's here and what kind of things you're interested in. So maybe what's one thing that you want to get out of this presentation or something you'd like to learn? 
So there will be a little bit of a delay on Facebook. I know that that plays a little bit longer, but here's uh, something from Nicole. She says that I'd love to learn something surprising uh, we can learn about using tree rings. Great, thanks, Nicole. Um, okay, so I'm gonna get going. Uh, so I want everybody to think about what a tree ring is. And then maybe if you have an answer, you can type it into the chat or you can just think about it but I want you to think about maybe something you've learned before. A lot of us have looked at tree rings when we go out for walks in the woods, maybe learned a little bit about them when we were young kids. Um, and so I want everybody to think about what this brings to mind, what kind of information they might encode. So tree rings are bands of wood cells that are formed during each growing season. And they can be used, used to determine tree age, but they also have a lot of other information in them. Uh, so this is a microscopic view of some tree rings um, and all the different parts of them. So tree rings start at the pith, which is right at the center of the tree, the part that we can't see. And then trees accrue annual rings every year of their growing season. And they're comprised of early wood, which is the light part, uh, and late wood, which is the dark part right here um, that happens at the end of the growing season. And then there's the cambium of the tree. This is the part of the tree that's alive. It's where the growth happens. Uh, so the cambium produces new cells uh, and it's what makes the trunk branches and the roots grow thicker. And then at the very outside of the tree is the bark. This is the part that we see, but there's a whole lot going on under the surface that we usually can't see. Uh, so one of the questions I have is how old is this tree? And feel free to type your answers into the chat. Okay, we've got a uh, guess from Nicole and from Kashfa. We've got seven from Nicole, eight from Kashfa. Um, I thought it was seven. Uh, Derek says nine. Uh, there's an eight, seven, nine. Sandy, Connie, and Roy, thanks for answering. Okay, yeah, great. So I'm seeing a lot of seven, eight, and nine. So this tree's actually seven years old. So the first ring goes from the pith out here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this little bit at the end is the early wood of the next growing season, but it hasn't finished growing yet. And this one here that looks like a double ring, trees do this and it's called a false ring. Um, so it can happen for a variety of reasons, sometimes because there's a lot of resources that growing season and sometimes for reasons, reasons that we don't fully understand. And trees can also have missing rings. So sometimes there should be a ring in a year, but it didn't put one down. And so for this reason, trees can also be kind of tricky to date, which is why in order to get the absolute date, we have to look at a lot of different samples of tree rings. So we do something called cross dating where we match up the patterns. So this diagram shows samples from three different places. The newest one is from a tree that's still alive. And so we know the outside ring date. The second one is from a dead tree that's standing. And the third one is from a log in a house. And these are also some of the different ways that we can get tree ring samples. So tree, tree rings have marker rings, which are uh, groups of rings or patterns of rings that are really noticeable or distinguishable. So maybe three years that are really close together and that pattern doesn't occur elsewhere on the record. So when we get lots of samples, we can line these patterns up and then we can know with certainty that we've dated the trees correctly. Uh, this can also let us date things that are no longer alive by matching them to existing samples. So the oldest living tree is a tree called Methuselah. Uh, it's almost 5,000 years old and it's a bristlecone pine in California and it's recognized as the oldest non-clonal tree uh, with the greatest confirmed age in the world. And we know it's this old through tree ring dating. Okay, so Nicole, I have a question that says, uh, would the trees that you match patterns with be the same species or could they be different species of a tree? So um, usually when we're building chronologies, we build them from the same species of tree um, if we can, because different species have different physiology so they can respond differently to environmental conditions. However, uh, it's more common in paleo research to work with species from just the same taxa, like maybe just pine species. Um, and the reason we do this is because of the availability of samples. 
So usually when we look at things um, further back in time, like say 10,000 years ago, um, it's harder to find the samples and we're more interested in general patterns. So that's a case where we might look at um, taxa from different species at the same time. Okay, so one of the questions I was just asked is, um, how do we count tree rings while they're still alive? So um, we do work with uh, cookie cuts of trees, so big slabs, but we usually only do that for dead trees. So if we wanted to learn about a forest, we wouldn't go into the forest and cut down all of the trees in it. So the way that we sample living trees is by looking at something called increment cores. Uh, these are pretty small. They're about the size of a pencil, like maybe this big. Uh, they're about five millimeters. And we take them from the side of the tree all the way into the center uh, and pull out a sample. And then we can take this into the lab and sand it and scan it and then measure the tree rings. And this doesn't hurt the tree. So these are pretty small and the tree will fill this hole with sap pretty quickly. Uh, so this is one of the ways that we can sample living trees. We can also cross date dead trees and we can get this information from a variety of sources. So snags are standing dead trees. Um, this one uh, initiated in 1879. And we can get that date by taking a sample um, likely with an increment borer in this case versus something like logs or stumps. We know this one's from 1936. And these ones we could use a chainsaw to take a piece off of because it's already dead. Uh, and hollow trees are also really interesting and we can date these as well. So tree rings can tell us about how old the tree is, but they can also tell us a lot more information. So um, in the chat, maybe think about why some tree rings are wide and others are narrow and what this might tell us about the environment the trees are growing in. Okay, I'm getting a lot of good answers. Drought, uh, shade, nutrients. Um, these are all things that can affect tree growth and they're things that can be reflected in tree rings. So we can use tree rings to not only understand things like things about climate, like temperature and precipitation, but also reconstruct them and also reconstruct climate oscillations like El Nino um, and lots of other climate patterns going back uh, thousands and tens of thousands of years. Uh, we can also use them to understand things like drought, um, changes in nutrients in the environment, competition with other trees. Um, so what trees might have been more dominant or less dominant at certain periods of time. We can understand things like insect outbreaks, like mountain pine beetle. Um, and we can also understand wildfire through trees. So we expect most tree rings to look like this, nice and round, symmetrical all the way around maybe a little bit of variation, but for the most part, they're the same. Uh, so I want everybody to think about what might have happened to this tree to make it look so different. Okay, I'm getting a lot of good answers. It actually survived a forest fire. So this is a fire scar. And this is what happens when a tree survives a fire. So um, I think a lot of us often think about a fire coming through a forest and killing all the trees, but a lot of the time trees actually survive fire and they survive many fires throughout their life. So here's a, one of those cookie cuts I was talking about. Uh, this is a tree ring uh, from in the caribou region and it initiated in 1809, and it's got two fire scars on it, uh, one from 1837 and one from 1858. So we can see it initiated here in 1809, and it started growing this way. But then a fire occurred, and this created a scar, so it couldn't keep growing in this direction the same way. And this was in 1837. So we can see the growth pushed out in the opposite direction until another fire happened this one in 1858. 
And then we can see the growth pushing out this way. So by doing this, we can understand when fires occurred in the past and also look at how many trees in a stand have these kind of scars to, do, to estimate some kind of reconstruction of fire regimes in the past and how these fires might have affected these trees. So trees are adapted to fire. A lot of them need fire to regenerate. Uh, so on the left, this shows ponderosa pine bark and ponderosa pine seeds or cones. Uh, these are really famous for um, having serotony or needing fire in order to regenerate. And then also trees like Douglas fir have this really thick bark that's adapted to fire. And so they can survive many, many fires over the period of their lifetime. We also know that forests are adapted to fire and they need fire to regenerate and stay healthy. So without fire, um, trees keep growing up in forests. Uh, and this can be a problem because forests are dynamic and they don't stay the same over time. And so fire helps forests move through a range of states. So when a fire occurs, uh, first we see annual plants and grasses coming back and then more flowers and shrubs and smaller trees before reaching a mature forest. And this is a cycle that these forests are adapted to. And we also know that all of the animals that live within forests are also adapted to fire. So animals use a range of conditions in forests that are associated with different fires and different kinds of wildfire. So new growth produces a variety of food for different kinds of animals. And as the forest grows, it provides food and a home for changing kinds of wildlife. So you can see in this picture, some animals are adapted to use all kinds of conditions created by wildfire, but some of them need a really short range of conditions. And so it's important to have this turnover so that we maintain the conditions these animals are adapted to. However, many of us may remember the 2017 and 2018 fire seasons, which were really catastrophic and set records in terms of the amount of area burned. We also know that wildfire in your homes can be really problematic and cause more harm than good. So this video, if I can get it to play, there we go. So this is a time lapse of a forest fire in 2015 near Nelson. And you can see all the cars driving along the highway um, watching this. And you can imagine how scary this would be to be driving by this. And if your home's really close by, you might be worried about um, the people at home or your pets or your house or your whole city. And there have been many instances in recent years of whole towns burning down because of forest fires that became out of control. Uh, part of this is because there's a lot more people living in cities now. And so that creates a lot of fuels. Um, and part of that is because of the weather conditions today that are much more extreme than they were in the past. So there's a lot of values associated with wildfire when we think about whether we wanna put a fire out. One thing that everybody agrees on is the most important thing is human life. And so we always wanna protect human life when fighting fires and human infrastructure or homes is also really important. And then after that, we start to think about things like timber or resources. Um, and we also wanna think about the health of the forest. What does the forest need? So in order to understand fires and why they might be different today, we need to understand what makes fire work on the landscape. So this is the fire triangle for wildfire. Uh, and it needs, a wildfire needs three things. It needs weather, so hot and dry weather um, promotes fire. Uh, because um, fires burn better when it's hot and dry and it also creates fuels that are more conducive to fire. So fuels are anything on the landscape that might burn. Uh, it could be materials on the forest floor, standing dead trees, um, live trees going up to the canopy that creates what's called ladder fuels, or it could be homes uh, or log piles outside your home. And fires also need topography. Um, so fire will generally burn uphill faster than downhill and the steeper the slope or the angle of the hill and the higher the fuel load, the faster the fire will burn, especially with wind driving the burning. So when we look at our landscape, we can think about what kind of things in the fire triangle might have changed on this landscape uh, over the past hundred years. So the first picture um, shows 1906 and the second picture shows 2018. Um, and you can list in the chat some of the differences you see in this landscape or the things that might have changed with regards to that fire triangle over this period of time. 
Okay, great. So I'm seeing a lot of good answers. So obviously there's a lot more trees on the modern landscape. Um, there's also different kinds of trees. So more of the trees are the same kind of species. Um, we've also changed things like the climate, which we can't see here, but we know is contributing to our fire seasons. Uh, and so some of the reasons for this are um, since 1900, we've changed what we're using the land for. So we plant trees to harvest for timber and it's a really valuable resource, but we also need to think about how that might affect wildfires on this landscape. Um, there's also more people on this landscape, so more cities, more dense cities, uh, and so more fuel associated with that. And we've also suppressed fire. So when we don't let fires burn, we get fire fuel accumulating so that when fires do occur, they're much worse than they would have been if we had let them burn initially. So this shows what fires might look like on those two different landscapes. The first one where we have frequent fire, it's burning up those fuels and creating a patchy landscape so that when fire does occur, it's not as bad. And then the bottom one, we can see what we call ladder fuels where we've got fuels leading from the bottom all the way up to the canopy. And this is how we get canopy fires that result in all of the trees in the stand dying as opposed to surface fires that burn on the forest floor and are, we know are a really important part of historic fire regimes in this region in southeastern BC. So does anybody recognize who this is? Yeah, Smokey the Bear. So Smokey the Bear uh, was introduced by the US Forest Service, but he's also been used in Canada. Uh, and he's been telling us for over 70 years that we need to prevent forest fires. And this is really important because uh, we only have so many resources to fight forest fires and we wanna keep people safe. So human caused forest fires um, put a burden on our fire suppression system and can be really problematic. But at the same time, we still need fires on the landscape. And we've been talking about suppressing fire in British Columbia for a really long time. This is from 1951. Uh, from Labor Day in Invermere. And here the Forest Service is telling us that fires dest destroy game. And so we have to prevent forest fires to keep our fires green, to keep our forests green. And so we know that it's really important to protect people, but we also need to protect our forest. And so by totally suppressing all forest fires, we're not creating forests that are very resilient to fire in the long term. Uh, part of this fire suppression paradox was also the loss of indigenous fire from our landscapes. So we know that historically indigenous people used fire to do a lot of things. They used it for cultural reasons and they used it to reduce risk of fire on the landscape. They used it to produce foods and berries. Um, but historically, uh, since colonization, we haven't allowed indigenous peoples to burn on this landscape, even though historically fire occurrence on this landscape was much higher due to indigenous land use than it would have been in the absence of people. And so this is another part of this narrative that we have to consider in the future. So fire scars and tree rings can help us understand what fire looked like before it was lost from our landscapes. Um, so in terms of our societal memory, most of us don't remember what landscapes look like with a lot of fire on them. And we have to be careful because fires can be a lot worse today than they were in the past. So part of the, reason, part of the way that we can understand how fires have changed is by looking at what they were like historically. So this Western larch survived a lot of fires in the past. Uh, maybe in the chat, does anyone want to guess how many fires that this tree survived before it died? So this tree actually survived eight fires in its lifetime. The first one was in 1692 um, and then in 1722. 1739, 1757, 1793, 1844, uh, 1886, and 1957, which is a lot of fires for a tree to survive. And the reason it survived this many fires is because there was frequent fire on this landscape at low and mixed severity levels that was really important for regeneration. It is very cool, I agree. Uh, so the mean fire interval here was 33 years, which is really often for a forest stand to survive. Uh, so this helps us get an idea of what kind of fire these trees are adapted to um, and how we might be able to replicate that today in a way that's safe. 
Uh, you can see also that compared to the first uh, fire scars I showed, these ones are a little bit harder to see. So in order for us to record these, uh, we also use microscopes to look at the fire scars and look for the physical signs of scarring. So when we get a lot of samples with trees with fire scars, we can do site level and region level reconstructions of fire history. So here we see uh, the region we're looking at, which is in southeastern BC near Cranbrook. And each of these lines represents a site level chronology. And each of the triangles represents one sc fire scar or evidence of fire on that landscape. So we can see that this record goes back to 1500. And we can see that there was a lot of fire on this landscape. The median fire interval is 10 to 26 years, uh, which is really frequent, much more frequent than we see in our fires today. Um, and we see that after 1950, there's almost no fire on this landscape. So many of these, uh, many of our forests have missed 10 fire return intervals, five fire return intervals. Um, and so they're really due for a fire. This can also, also help us understand how we might kind of start to replicate these patterns on our landscapes. So these cartoons are from Australia, so there's kangaroos in them but I think that they're also really relevant to British Columbia and there's lots of things that we can learn from them. Uh, so one of the things that we've started to think about is restoring fire to our landscape in a way that's safe. So this can look like a number of things. It can look like fuel treatments. So going into reduced fuel loading, uh, we can introduce prescribed burning on the landscape and also help to reintroduce indigenous uses of fire, um, which is an important way to also address the historic loss of indigenous fire on landscapes. So a lot of thought goes into restoring fire. Uh, we have to think about the flora and fauna that live there and what kind of fire they're adapted to. We also need to think about the fire history, which is where the tree rings come in, and think about what kind of fire, what severity of fire, what frequency of fire, what time of year to burn that these forests are adapted to. And considering when to burn is also really important for risk. So we wouldn't do a prescribed burn in July or August during a bad fire season when it's really hot. We would typically do one in the spring or fall when there's rain forecasted. We know the risk is much lower and it's much less likely that that fire is going to escape. We also need to consider heavy fuel loads. So we need to think about fire behavior and how that fire might burn. And of course, we have to think about life and property. So if we're gonna do a prescribed burn, we need to make sure that everybody in the area knows about it and um, knows how to be safe and knows what to do if they see something happening. Uh, and so there's a lot of things that, going in, that go into planning a burn safely and in order to make them successful. So here's what a relatively large and successful prescribed burn might look like. This is in uh, Jasper. And um, you can see the fire starting at the top of the mountain and burning its way down. Parks are also a place that's been using prescribed burning for quite a while because they're protected and they're mandated um, to protect the forests and conserve them. And so these are models where we can often um, work to implement um, prescribed burning systems and then introduce them outside of this context. So you can see the fire continuing to burn as it gets darker um, and eventually it'll get dark out and you can see the embers burning. And then we get the temperature inv inversion and the smoke floods the valley. Okay, so there's a lot of things to think about here. Um, because of the way we've used the land over the past hundred years and the way that the climate is changing, fires today can be really dangerous, but we also need to learn how to live with fire so that they don't continue to become worse. So we have to think hard about how we might coexist with fire so that we can stay safe and our forests can be healthier. Uh, this can look like a lot of things like fuels management and ecosystem restoration, also using prescribed fire, um, but it also has to do with how we view fire. Um, there's a narrative that fire is bad on our landscapes um, and that we have to suppress it. And this is something that we've been talking about. A narrative to understand that fire isn't bad, forests need fire to survive, but we have to think about how we're gonna do so safely.
Okay, that's all I have. Um, but I'm happy to take as many questions as people have. Um, and I'm also on Twitter and my email is up there if anyone wants to contact me. Great, thank you very much, Jen. Um, I had a question from before from Sheila and she was wondering about when you're taking the core samples, is that is that a risk for insects getting into the, the borehole? Uh, that's a really, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, usually it's not too much of a risk because trees are adapted to having insects try to dig into them and they actually have a lot of defenses. So as soon as there's any kind of physical damage to the tree, it floods that hole with sap um and that will push the insect out and there's some really cool videos out there that show battles between insects and trees uh one of the bigger risks is actually if the increment borer is dirty and you put it on the ground it could introduce some kind of disease to that tree because you're putting mm. it all the way into the middle so one thing we do is always make sure that they're sterile and clean and i also have cord in some places like provincial parks where they want you to fill that hole after um, just to reduce any risk. So I've done that before with beeswax. And usually if you go back after a couple hours, the tree swells to fill that hole. So it'll push the wax out. Um, but that's one of the ways that we can try to mitigate any risk, especially for species that are um, really at risk for pathogens um, or insects in a region. Thanks, that's great. Um, did you want me to, I'll read out Chloe's. Um, how do you keep a prescribed fire from getting out of control? Right, so there's a lot of ways uh, and a lot of things we think about with prescribed fire. So part of it has to do with um, modeling fire on that landscape and thinking about how fire might burn, but there's always crews ready to go um, if a fire is outside the boundaries of what was set. But we do set fire breaks on the landscape. We have crews on hand, we have plans um, so that if something happens, we're ready to respond right away. And the earlier you respond to an issue, the easier it is to prevent it from getting larger. And again, the time of year is also really important. Um, so if you have a fire burning during low fire risk uh, time of year, then it's much less like, likely to have a fire escape. Uh, I'll read out Nicole's. Uh, for prescribed birds, how do they get started? Is it as simple as lighting a match? And then a second question for uh, natural fires is lighting, uh, lightning the primary way of starting a forest fire. Yeah, so with prescribed burns, depending on how it's done, um, sometimes they actually have fuel that they drop out of helicopters or planes um, into the forest if it's in a remote area. If it's a smaller prescribed burn, often there'll be a fuel source that you're spraying out and then lighting along fire lines. And this is also part of the way that we can be really strategic about where the fire is going to burn. Um, so letting it burn in the direction towards the fire break where we know it's going to stop and monitoring it. Um, and with regards to uh, the primary ways that forest fires are started, yeah, so um, lightning in British Columbia is the main way that forest fires are started, but there's also a really important human element to that. And so um, in the context of uh, accidental fires, that can look like campfires or people throwing a cigarette out their car window. Um, but also historically in the fire record, indigenous fires were also um, a really common way that fires were started. And we know that based on um, cultural histories. Um, so there's some people in our lab that work within indigenous communities looking at wildfire. And we also know that based on the time of year that fire is burned. So a lot of fire set intentionally in the spring, um, again, to reduce that risk. Do, should I read it? Okay. Uh, so Deep T says, uh, when we are talking about controlled forest fires, how do we control the air pollution and related environmental impact, water, et cetera? Yeah, also a really good question and something that's talked about a lot in the literature. Um, so one of the things we know is that high severity fires um, typically have worse air pollution effects. And so um, one of the questions we've been asking is not um, whether you want to fire, but when and how you want the fire. So another thing that's thought about with prescribed burns is air quality. So there's a very short window that prescribed burns can happen. Um, and we obviously want to minimize the impact to human health. Um, and so typically it's a question of how do you want your smoke? Um, and so we think about where we're burning and um, how large that burn is going to be and what the impact of air pollution is. And same thing with the environmental impact. So 
um, fires that are out of control that occur with really high fuel loading during the worst parts of the fire season tend to have the largest environmental impact. Um, and so prescribed burning is a way that we can mitigate those impacts. Great. Um, and then Roy asks, um, do branches that fall from the top of the tree also provide you with an age from that point? Um, they can, yes, depending on the size of them. Um, but typically we would use the main trunk of the tree because it's a more reliable estimate of age. Um, but again, if you go further back in the historical record, then your sample size is more restricted and then people will use whatever wood samples they can find. Okay. Uh, okay. So Sheila asks, um, pine beetle is able, uh, the pine beetle is able to survive the lodgepole defense mechanisms to bore inside bark. Are you familiar with other insects that have that skill to invade other tree species? Yeah, so um, pine beetle, I believe, is dendroctinus, and a lot of invasive insects have really similar physiology, and so they use the same kind of semiochemicals um, and symbioses with fungi to also invade other tree species. I believe spruce beetle also does something really similar, um, but um, I'm not an insect ecologist by any means, so I think it's really interesting, um, but kind of outside of my range of study. Okay. Um, uh, Lynn asks, oops, uh, Lynn asks, are wildlife biologists included in planning prescribed burns? Yes, definitely. Um, so another important aspect of prescribed burns and conservation planning in general is consulting with wildlife biologists, specifically in the context of species at risk. Um, so we need to make sure that doing prescribed burning isn't going to have a negative impact on species at risk and that we're using it in places where there are species that are adapted to wildfire and also need it to survive. But typically with low severity fires, unlike all of the videos we saw of people rescuing koalas in Australia, um, here with fires that are historically normal, animals are pretty good at getting out of forest in time. And so we don't have to go in and take them out ourselves. Oh, that's great. Um, Sheila asks, is prescribed burning being used in monoculture species to remove underbrush? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I know a little bit about this. I know that some companies like Canfor do use some prescribed burning, um, particularly after um, harvesting to help deal with the amount of fuels that are left over. Um, but I think it's also something that could be done more often. Oh, and just a comment from Roy, so a thank you, uh, and it's an important concept to understand, and, uh, and thanks for the great communicating. Um, also, DPT has, uh, uh, is the controlled burning used to remove invasive species? Also a really good question. Um, so there's a lot of disagreement in the literature about the pros and cons of prescribed burning when you do have a lot of invasive species. Um, some research says that invasive species might be able to establish better after a fire, and some species say that native species might establish better after fire because they're adapted to wildfire versus invasive species are really opportunist. Um, so I think it's really context dependent. Um, there are some cases where controlled burning can be used to remove invasive species, and it can be really important, especially in grassland restoration, um, but it depends on the species and the knowledge of the system. Uh, I think that's all we have so far. Is, um, so if you do have another question, go ahead and type it in. Uh, we'll read one more from Deepti. Uh, is the controlled burning used to, oh, no, she did that one. Okay. So, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we all want to thank you for doing this talk. We found it very interesting. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so I'm going to just uh, share my screen to, to finish up. Um, and just to say goodbye. Uh, and if you are looking for a way to support the museum, um, there are a couple links there, our donation link and our membership link. And uh, next week, we at the same time, of the same time, one o'clock Wednesday, uh, we have Backyard Biodiversity, Pressing and Preserving Spring Plants with Linda Jennings, our collections curator in the vascular plants and algae in the herbarium.
Uh, so again, that's one o'clock. And if you are interested in connecting with us at, on social media, look for at BD Museum and uh, more online resources at BD at Home. And we definitely welcome all sorts of feedback to uh, the BD survey to let us know about um, your thoughts on these programs. Uh, so again, our virtual programs are a new thing for us. So we'd love to hear from you. And uh, there's just our last uh, uh, whale there. Uh, thanks again, Jen. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing so you can see. Uh, yep. Any last thoughts for us uh, as we say goodbye to everyone? Yeah. We're good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Thanks so much for having me. This was a pleasure. I'm really excited to be able to share some yeah. of this information. Um, and yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Feel free to leave the meeting and uh, we'll close up.